Okay guys, today we're going to be talking about some iconic knives and I'm going to be ranking them essentially not necessarily against each other but more or less kind of ranking them in a fashion of would I carry this, is it recommendable you know to use for wilderness applications and overall uh, you know is it a good knife and also aside from that kind of ranking or kind of talking about what made it iconic just so i'm not throwing random knives on a list and saying this knife right here was iconic so as always before we get into the video please don't forget to comment like share subscribe check out the patreon and the instagram all the support really means a lot Okay, so the first of the iconic knives we're going to talk about, probably the most iconic one on the list, unarguably, is going to be the K-Bar. Now, this is a classic one, of course, this one's leather, and the K-Bar has been around in some fashion or form since around World War II when they were issued to the military and issued for a very long time before Gerber kind of came along and kind of stole the contract or stole their uh, thunder. But until then, really the K-Bar in its classic form, the USMC fighting and utility blade like this one, was the classic fashion and many a knife lover and a knife user were started with these knives because a lot of, you know, shooting sports started with military applications a lot of knife collecting and knife using in wilderness kind of the rebirth of wilderness living and such started with military backgrounds in survival so once again the k-bar makes a lot of sense that it was one of the first blades around to fill that need in that purpose now that being said does it is it a fantastic knife? I don't think it's necessarily the worst one on the list. I think some of the big props that the classic K-Bar has going for it is it's made out of a pretty good steel 1095 CV or chromium vanadium. So this is a 1095 alloy that uh, has slightly better edge retention, slightly better rust resistance. Now it's still definitely 1095, so it's not perfect, but the CV does help uh, out a little bit or the extra chromium and vanadium do help out a little bit. So it definitely, as far as a steel goes, is a pretty solid steel, but that's essentially, so it has a good steel and it has a good blade length for most general wilderness applications, but unfortunately that's basically where the good things stop. This knife was definitely designed from the grounds up to be more of a fighting knife, so the handle itself is very homogenous, and while in some regards that is a good thing for outdoor blades, it's not really a good design, This, at least this ovular or this um, this kind of uh, design for a handle is not necessarily the best for um, wilderness use. Now it's not necessarily unergonomic, but it is not the best for trying to hold a knife for long periods of time. Of course, being that this is designed to be a fighting knife, it kind of has more of a buoy styled blade. So the tip is not as strong as on some of the other knives we'll talk about. And of course, this guard is designed for protecting your hand in a knife fight, but also really gets in your way when you're trying to choke up on the blade and do different finer tasks to manipulate the knife in different ways. Of course, too, there has been a lot of speculation and talk about the quality of these knives. Now, I have baton and beat the heck out of my K-Bar, and I've never had any issues with it. As you guys can probably see, it does look pretty worn, but um, you know, I've never really had any issues with mine breaking. Of course, it's still in one piece, but the rat tail tang, even though it is still a full tang, is questionable of integrity because it is such a large reduction. You know, you have a blade that in width, give a blade that in width is probably about, you know, an inch and a half, maybe an inch and a quarter, but then it really tapers down to less than an inch and maybe about, you know, a half inch at the rat tail tang. So you really lose a lot of blade strength when you taper the tang so drastically. So overall, I would probably not recommend it for wilderness use, especially because there are much better blades you can get out there nowadays. And even, uh, you know, there are different, uh, synthetic options for the k-bar still probably wouldn't recommend them of course the leather option would probably be the worst for wilderness applications because when you have a leather sheath leather handle uh, those types of things tend to retain moisture and that leads to rusting it leads to breakdown of the fibers of leather and so overall a lot of this knife is very destructible by the elements so overall not a very fantastic option
Okay, the next one up on the list is going to be the Falcon Even F1. Now, the reason why this one made the list, I don't think that the F1 is as synonymous or iconic in, a la or in America, but this is a pilot survival knife. It was designed for that purpose in mind, and that's what made uh, Falcon Even one uh, or one Falcon even kind of put them on the map was the F1. You know, re the reason why we have actually heard a lot about Falcon even is due to the F1 and its military use. So that's kind of, uh, this knife really put Falcon even on the map and is kind of made itself or made Falcon even iconic through this knife, similar to kind of K-Bar in a way. Okay, so what do I think about the Falcon Even F1? I really do like this blade, and as far as a kind of approval rating goes, I say it's kind of mixed because while this knife is marketed as a pilot survival knife, and in that application, this is probably a better survival knife. So this is probably a better knife than alternatives for other types of pilot survival knives, maybe like the LMF2. Uh, as far as it goes, this knife, similar to the LMF2, in my opinion, are just a little bit small for general wilderness and survival applications. This knife makes a pretty good size and is pretty good for you know smaller, maybe like camping, hiking, and bushcraft types of wilderness excursions. But as far as a survival knife goes, as it is marketed, I would probably recommend avoiding it in those regards. So while this knife does have some good merit to it and the, self, the knife itself, as far as quality and build is just fine, you know, you can really beat the heck out of it. And ironically, it does have a rather thick spine. So as far as, you know, being able to abuse this knife or even hard use this knife, I have very little doubt that it would perform well in any given application that, you know, requires strength or durability. It's just more a realistic kind of function of is this knife large enough to process a good enough wood or a good enough amount of wood to sustain a fire overnight? Is this knife going to be large enough to take down wood or the type of wood that you would need or foliage to build a proper wilderness shelter? These are the questions you have to ask yourself, and I think that the F1 in those regards, once again, is not a bad knife, but just not built to those tasks. So the next one up on the list is a Cold Steel SRK, and I think that this blade has a pretty long-standing track record with a lot of uh, SAR or search and rescue teams in America and all over the globe. And I think that that is really what has solidified the name for the SRK as the name stands for Search and Rescue Knife. This blade was originally designed by and for search and rescue teams, and uh, they were looking for a knife that would be, once again, a very good general purpose blade if they needed to do anything like get someone out of a particular area or if they themselves got lost or into a predicament uh, they could have a blade to hunker down you know build a light shelter get some brush start a fire do whatever they realistically needed that's what the SRK was originally designed to be a search and rescue knife something that uh, search and rescue teams could carry on them that would be you know pretty light pretty minimal and still fully functional for wilderness teams. That being said, it is a very good survival knife and especially considering the price, at least for the more budget offerings, you know, of course the CPM 3V option that was offered a while ago was a little bit more expensive. The San Mai version is actually still pretty reasonable. It's just over a hundred dollars. And uh, this blade actually does borrow a lot from our earlier blade uh, manufacturer, Falkneven, their version of the A or the Falkneven A1 and the Cold Steel SRK bear some striking resemblances and I'm not sure you know who copied who but being that the Falcon even F1 kind of already existed likely Cold Steel took some inspiration from the A1 and it's not necessarily a bad thing the A1's a great blade and I think that the SRK is a really attainable way to get um S or Falcon even A1 performance in a budget version especially if you go with the San Mai version of the SRK you're definitely getting a Falcon even A1 like blade or a lot of the qualities that make that blade good, but for a fraction of the cost, about half the cost. So anyways, you know, copies aside, the Cold Steel SRK is still its own design. It is its own knife, but it is a very capable, very wilderness driven blade that I think is extremely hard to beat, especially if you think about any of the budget offerings. 
and if it wasn't clear enough already, I definitely totally recommend the SRK uh, for just about any type of wilderness excursions. You could push it into bushcrafting, not going to be the best. Once again, a blade like the Falcon even F1 will perform better in those regards. Okay, let's jump into a little bit more. Most of the blades we talked about were kind of designed, developed in the 1900s, you know, late 1900s, obviously, like 1980s, 1990s uh, was when the Falkneven F1 and SRK kind of came to be. But now we're jumping into the early 2000s with the Tom Brown or TB tracker made by Topps. Now, there are a number of companies that make trackers and, of course, clones of trackers, but uh, this is a true TB or Tom Brown tracker, and uh, if you don't want to get the custom trackers, this is the most attainable way to get a tracker. Now, the tracker rose to preeminence in the early 2000s when this kind of, or early 2000s, kind of 2008 to 2012, where a lot of people were looking for that kind of one tool do all option, and they thought the TB tracker would be that. And a lot of times you would see blades coming out with, you know, quarter inch thick steel similar to the tb tracker you know just very built up kind of really tanky blades now this has luckily kind of died off here now in tw in the 2020s you know the 20 teens was a little bit popular but uh this this was definitely a part of the trend or a part of the movement that you saw back then where you had this one tool option uh you know it's kind of partially inspired by the spetsnaz uh kind of machete that had like an oxygen tank wrench it was a machete it had some other different functions in it um, you know th these all kind of uh, coalesced and made this really popular trend for the knife community that being said um, what do I think of the TB tracker uh, this blade is definitely an interesting knife it is what I would say one of those knives that if you get it you have to get it with be the mindset that it's going to be more of a tool than a knife I like to really summarize this blade as a knife like tool and uh, that is because it is capable of doing a lot more and the practice and kind of mindset behind using a TB tracker is different than how you would use a traditional knife in some regards of course it still does have a blade you know you can still feather stick with it you know you can do stuff like that but you know you have this chopping element towards the front you have this multi grind you have a spine uh, saw kind of like saw back spine and so you know this blade is designed to do different tasks and so if you come at it with trying to understand the tool and how best you can utilize it I think that this is a realistic option but I think most people will come to the TV tracker you know a lot of people come to it expecting a very traditional knife something like this SRK and they try to use the TV TB tracker as an SRK and you know they try to uh, you know push it into roles that you'd use this or the SRK with and they get very disappointed when the knife doesn't perform in the manner that they're expecting and that once again really goes back to the fact that this is a knife like tool not a knife per se and so as far as my recommendation goes when it comes to recommending the uh, tops TB tracker I usually recommend it to people who have you know quite a few knives and want to really use a knife that's going to challenge them and challenge their mindset on how to make a multi purpose tool work the tb tracker does work in certain conditions and like i said under certain mindsets but if this is like your first knife and you're just getting into blades i usually recommend against this knife because it is not going to be what you expect it to be and it's not going to perform the way that you want it to uh, so that's what i have to say about the tops tb tracker it's not a bad blade i've owned this one for i think going on three years now and uh you know i use it every once in a while it's not a mainstay or frontline option for me but there is a community of people that really do swear by the tv tracker you know it did have its kind of claim to fame back in 2008 2010 maybe 2012 and i believe it was featured in some films as well and you know of course everything coalesced to make the knife more popular Okay, next what we're gonna talk about is the SC4. Now the SC4 for me is an iconic knife, but maybe a lot of people don't find it as iconic, but the SC4 and the reason why I think it's iconic 
iconic is that this is kind of the unspoken or kind of unofficial blade of Sear School. You'll see a lot of people that go, or if, if you're in the right groups and you know the right people, you'll see a lot of people that end up going to Sear School, end up using the uh, SE4 throughout their training and time there. And the SE4 for me is not my own personal favorite blade. Like I don't absolutely love the SE4. I think it is growing on me more. I think it is a better knife than I originally thought. And it is still, I mean, it's always been a very capable blade. I just think that it's a little bit small for survival purposes, in my opinion, and especially when you consider that knives like the SE6 exist, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I think that, you know, the SE4 is, is a little bit underwhelming. I'd much rather either have an SE3 or an SE6. That being said, the SE4, without a doubt, like I said, is still like the unofficial knife of Sear Schools. So essentially, you know, they must be doing something right with this blade. And I think they are. I think it is a pretty good and pretty venerable option. It is a very incredibly tough knife. And I think that's why uh, a lot of people like it is because it's very hard to break and it's very robust and it's a reasonably compact size. You know, it's not as small as the SE3, but it still gives you, you know, a little bit better, but still pretty darn compact. You know, you're not realistically going to be, um, you're not going to encounter any task that this blade or this size of knife can, you know, span that you won't be able to do. Once again, you know, trying to baton a piece of wood this long might be doable, just barely, you know, if you use literally every inch or every centimeter of the blade, you might be able to baton something like that. But Overall, the SE4 is not a bad option. I would certainly recommend it if you are looking for a very tough, very robust blade that is around this size length. And we'll get into it a little bit, the uh, Gerber strong arm. But if you are looking for a knife like around the same size as the Gerber strong arm, you know, the SE4 is going to be very tough, very robust, and still actually give you a lot of really good slice ability or, you know, slicing because that full flat grind really does just pick up wood and just curl it. So really good at going, you're going to be really good, or this is going to be a really fantastic option. Now, I feel like the SC6 doesn't fit into any specific or right or proper, maybe iconic point, but I feel like this blade is very iconic because I, I feel like uh, you see this knife a lot with search and rescue people, especially, you know, your more kind of seasoned people. I feel like you see a lot of these uh, SE6s with a lot of experienced search and rescue people. You see them a lot on YouTube. And uh, overall, the SE6 is a very, very solid knife. So while I can't necessarily say an exact point that makes this iconic, I feel like I see the SE6 in a lot of places. And it's because it is such a venerable, such a good multi-role blade. Would I recommend it? Absolutely, every day, all day. The only thing I really dislike about the SE6 is that out of box, unless you make modifications, you cannot strike a ferro rod off the spine of this blade. So you do have to modify it in that regard, but it's not a super hard modification. And obviously I would definitely recommend making that modification. But once you do that, you know, you have a good size blade length for doing a wide variety of tasks. And this is a very capable knife and it has, it borrows a lot of its toughness and resilience from things like the SE4, SE3. All the SEs are built very tough and really hard to break. So this is a fantastic option and I would absolutely recommend an SE6 to just about anyone. Okay, so essentially that was the end of the iconic blades. Hopefully you enjoyed taking a look at some of these knives and uh, you know, kind of going over what made them iconic and whether or not I recommended them. A lot of them are solid. And of course, iconic blades kind of come to be because a lot of people end up using them and end up finding them to be good blades for their own personal uses and their own personal missions, objectives, and so on. So a lot of iconic blades are pretty darn good, but of course a lot are also not. So do always be wary. You know, I'm not saying to just buy into the fact that, you know, thousands of people use or like a particular knife that doesn't necessarily mean it's a great blade for you or your application but at some point too they might be on to something as well so as always guys god bless and i'm out